Um, and mine's also, well, my next one is, is also a little bit serious, but, but at the same time has serious sort of ooh, visual factor. Um, it is, well, in fact, I shall just read out the full name of the piece. It's from the UC, it's from the Gallant Lab at UC Berkeley, which is a fantastic name and a great university. It's called Reconstructing Visual Experiences from Brain Activity Evoked by Natural Movies. So the thing is, we're starting to be able to, uh, measure what someone is seeing by looking at uh, their brain activity using functional magnetic resonance imaging. The problem with this is that it's one thing to do this with static images, but the way that they do it, which basically looks at sort of how oxygen levels in the brain change, is tricky with visual images because this this means of measurement is quite slow. Um, and, and sort of the way the blood... Uh, oxygen levels change in the brain is also quite slow. Anyway, this lab has come up with a new way. They've, they've used new models and very, very clever new techniques to get around this. So it's still using fMRI technology, but a completely new way. And what they found, and you can go and look at videos of what they were able to reconstruct, they have found a way to sort of reconstruct the moving images that people are seeing, at least to some extent. It's not crystal clear wow. quality. It's not even 720p. Um, <laughs> but you get sort of blobs that move in, in the right directions and in the right sort of ways. And, and it's just absolutely, it's so, so, so clever. And of course, this is particularly interesting for um, all, all kinds of, of, of things, but basically it's brain decoding. We are learning to read minds. Now, I'm not going to get into all of the ethical considerations about that and the sort of bad and good factors, but it's something that we are going to continue doing, and it's good to see people like this doing such good work. I, I had great amounts of time going and pressing on the clips, and you can play around and sort of guess what people might have been looking at and try and match things up and great great amounts of fun it's kind of like the Rorschach tests it, it really is but but super clever at the same time I'm not going to explain the maths because I don't understand it <laughs> <laughs> oh cool so talking of imaging my next article it just hit my nanoscience radar and I was like oh my god um, so there's only one nanoscience thing I've actually included this week uh, <laughs> it was much heart wrench that I put the others into other interesting things but this is cool so one of the problems is that uh, all of uh, a lot of mammalian cells are full of the these little fibrous things. They could be like the collagen from your hair and teeth and nails. They could be actin filaments, which are mm -hmm. like uh, cells equivalent of a skeleton in mm -hmm. certain aspects. But they're very, very dynamic. They're not like a, a human skeleton. So they're constantly being formed and being dissolved and being um, created into one thing and then mixed into another. It's all very, very exciting. Yep. But these things are tiny and really, really hard to watch, especially in real time. This is where nanoscience comes in. So there's these things called nanoparticles, which are really, 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 really small particles. Um, the ones in this paper are actually gold nanoparticles, and we're pretty good at those. We've used them for all sorts of different things. We have. But what this group has done is that they've showed if you get a gold nanoparticle and you stick it on one of these nanoscale fibers, so a piece of collagen or a piece of actin, you can use a laser to slide it right the way down the length of the, la of the actin, and you can track it. So what they've done oh. is they've got this, and they've managed to use these sliding gold nanomatic particles to map out these um, these nanoscale proteins and these nanoscale fibers in three dimensions. And they've got these three-dimensional models. And this works inside living cells. Oh, wow. Which is really cool. They did it in um, mouse, mouse ovary cells. Uh, sorry, Chinese hamster ovary cells, as well as a few others. And um, it gives you... 10 nanometer resolution, which is absolutely fantastic for anything, let alone in real time. Um, and this is on, so you can see the fibers growing, you can see them disappearing, you can watch which directions they form, and this technique, if it gets taken up, will actually allow us to investigate things like attachment to um, extracellular matrices, which has implications for cancer and all sorts of other mm. kind of research. It's just a very cool technique um, using light to shift around these little gold nanoparticles. Very, very, very <laughs> clever. But gold nanoparticles and light have been played with for things including treating cancer. Uh, well, that was infrared, in fact, to be specific. All kinds of it's stuff. It's the same here. But oh, it's the same here. Yeah. Fantastic. They've, they've, they've been using gold nanoparticles to uh, enhance Raman spectroscopy, which is, uh, and they've now used that to detect individual molecules, like one molecule, what? not not even a nanoparticle, just a single molecule. So it's, it's cool stuff going on with nanoparticles. Fantastic. All about imaging. We love the imaging technologies. The more we can see, the more we can understand. Absolutely. And 
going back up to the slightly bigger again. Uh, I'm going to start off, there are sort of two pieces to this bit and, and the usual segue because we like them so much, particularly this week. Um, the first one is an opinion piece in New Scientist. It's entitled, Engineers Can Build a Low-Carbon World If We Let Them, and was penned by, if you give me a moment to scroll, Colin Brown, who's the Director of Engineering at the UK's Institution of Mechanical Engineers. And it's a great piece. To sum it up, he says that the only thing that's really stopping us building a low-carbon world is political and public will. Mechanical engineers are all over this challenge. A lot of the technologies are, if not completely ready, then rapidly getting there. And mechanical engineers are in fact stepping up and saying, look, we've got to do something about climate change. We've got to do something about emissions, about dirty energy, about all of the problems that we're facing. And we know how. And in fact, a lot of this we have already developed, but we cannot put it into place without uh, politicians and governments really sort of coming on board, putting the money into building the infrastructure and really doing something about this. It's it's an absolutely fantastic opinion piece. Uh, it's And it's really nice to see large groups of people getting together and saying something. So, for example, at a, what he says is a landmark London conference convened by the UK's Institution of Mechanical Engineers, 11 national engin uh, engineering institutions representing 1.2 million engineers from across the world under the banner of something called the Future Climate Project, which is a very interesting project in and of itself, made a joint call for action at uh, the COP17 Climate Change Conference, which is happening this December in my homeland, South Africa. Fantastic to see. It's very, very cool. Um, and partly why that, well, the segue here is, in fact, that the reason we are doing the podcast a day late is that I spent this weekend driving a hybrid car. I drove it on Saturday from Wellington, Auckland, and then on Sunday I got up early and then drove it from Auckland back to Wellington. The reason I was doing that was partly practice for the Mongol Rally, which I'm doing next year, but also because I'd never gotten to drive a hybrid before, and as a clean tech or as something that is called a clean tech, it was interesting to see sort of how it drove and to get to learn a little bit more about the engine, because it forced me to go and look up how they work. So... I'm not going to talk hugely about it. There are posts and, and we'll link to more sort of posts about it. But basically what hybrids do is they mix an internal combustion engine, which burn all the dirty petrol and diesel and things and make all the horrible emissions. And they put them in conjunction with an electric motor. Now, whereas with an electric vehicle, you would be feeding that electric motor with electricity from your sort of main supply system. So there are questions around how clean that electricity is, particularly in other countries. In hybrid engines, um, the internal combustion engine fuels the electric motor as well. And the idea of using the electric motor is sort of threefold. Firstly, they use something called regenerative braking, which basically means that when you brake, all the kinetic energy that you would otherwise lose is heat, which is why your brakes get hot. Anyway, that gets fed back into a battery so that energy can be used later. Um, flywheels do this as well in, in some cars. Um, you can also start the car using the battery rather than a starter engine. So again, this cuts down fuel use. And in some hybrids, they completely kill the combustion engine when you're sitting at traffic lights or anything like that. So you've got no idling at all. Uh, kills noise as well, which is pretty cool. Um, and it helps the engine. So the idea is if you're accelerating or you're going up a hill or anything like that, the electric motor then kicks in with energy that it's stored in the battery and sort of gives a little bit of extra oomph. What this means is not necessarily that your car is the fastest thing up a hill. It does mean that you can have an engine with a lower capacity. So we would, the car that I was driving is nominally a 1.3 liter, which normally has no guts whatsoever on a hill. And this basically became a 1.8. Which was kind of cool. Um, of course, driving hybrids is, is interesting in all kinds of other ways. It's a different type of transmission. They're automatic. Um, driving it efficiently actually does take a lot of concentration. You don't just drive it normally and, and think that you're going to be fine. But it's a, it's certainly an interesting technology, particularly since EVs, uh, electric vehicles, aren't quite there yet. We haven't sorted out this whole hydrogen engine thing. So for the moment, hybrids are kind of the best of, of what we've got affordably. And it was kind of fun. <laughs> and it felt like a spaceship. <laughs> so that was our segue onto the Cyblogs uh, section of the podcast. Mm. Amy's got a really good post on hybrids, the various technologies and uses. Uh, the other one that we picked up this week, so on Thursday last week, there was a meeting of the 
Science Communicators Association of New Zealand or a discussion panel that we mentioned in Auckland. Mm. One of our bloggers uh, went along uh, to that, Anna Sanford. She blogs at Forensic Scientist. And uh, one of the things that came out was the relationship between emotion and science. So this particularly is in context of the February quake in Christchurch where yes. the public wanted information and scientists were um, either unprepared or unwilling to give it because it was going to be used to fuel more fears and other the people whose name who shall remain nameless took complete advantage of that and the question came up whether science should be uh, promoted um, completely cold and heartless and completely emotionless and thus entirely factual or whether you do have to put some emotion in with your presentation of science to get the public and other scientists to actually connect with this it's just a really interesting discussion i'm i'm still the jury's still kind of out on it for me but there are a couple of good comments as well from someone called amy whit whitcroft um <laughs> and uh, anna's own own reply but it's a really, really interesting topic. I, I sit more on the emotion side of the fence, I think, but that's, that's, I love to talk to people about science, so that's highly unsurprising. And it is also important for science to remain uh, impartial. To remain factual, absolutely. And I think that's where the dividing line is going to come down, is, is sort of, you can't communicate, well, emotions aren't data unless you're in something like psychology, but potentially there is a way to present what they call the cold hard facts in such a way that you're sufficiently human that, you know, maybe the public isn't scared of you. We're, we're seeing there's there's so much debate going on around it as scientists over the last decade have realized that they kind of need to figure out a, almost a sort of a group strategy for for communicating science mm, it, it does change as well though so anna mentions in this because anna is a forensic scientist yes. that she is legally bound to promote um to put sorry to explain her science in a non-emotive way absolutely she has to be impartial yes and she's dealing with uh, things like the courts and and whatnot so as as elf rightly points out it would vary hugely depending on exactly the field that one is in i imagine 